Are supercharged lab enhanced viruses becoming a global threat? Gain of function research? Gain of function. So called gain of function research, known as gain of function. The controversy around so called gain of function research has erupted alongside the heated debate around the coronavirus pandemic's origin. It's a tale of two theories. A lot of Democrats poo pooed the whole idea of the lab leak. Prominent public health experts saying that the lab leak theory, which was previously hawked by conspiracy theorists, might actually be credible. This has moved high-risk gain-of-function research from the secretive shadows into the public spotlight. We've set out to investigate why, how, and where this type of research is being done, and what the risks and benefits are. So what exactly is gain-of-function? It is a type of research that makes pathogens like viruses deadlier or more infectious to humans. The researchers intentionally modify the virus in lab experiments to give it new functions. For instance, the ability to spread by air or attack human nerve cells. Gain-of-function research seeks to make a virus more easily transmissible between humans to increase the severity of the disease it triggers or to make it resistant to existing treatments or vaccines. Sounds crazy. Two main reasons are given for why this type of research is done. One is to better predict which viruses in animal populations might one day naturally mutate and become infectious for humans. The second is to be better prepared when a new pandemic hits, for instance, by already developing a vaccine for it preemptively. There are obviously valid reasons for gain of function research, and the main reason is to understand pathogens better, to understand the way they transmit and behave, and thereby to make vaccines, drugs, etc. So how many vaccines have been developed as a result of gain-of-function research? None. <laughs> uh, there have been no preemptive vaccines to date. Have any pandemics been prevented thanks to gain-of-function research? The answer is not that I know of. Not that I'm aware. What's clear is that it didn't prevent this coronavirus pandemic. Actually, none of the gain-of-function research that was done over the past decades or whatever, like none of it contributed to finding a vaccine or, or cure for SARS-CoV-2, for COVID-19. But in the future, there could be potential for that. Some scientists think this is a perfectly legitimate endeavor. Others say it's akin to checking for a gas leak by holding a match to the gas pipe. In the effort to protect us from a pandemic, scientists could cause a pandemic. So let's look a bit more closely at how gain-of-function research is done. One method is to genetically re-engineer pathogens by inserting genes from one virus into another to make it more aggressive. Another simpler method is called animal passaging. Researchers inject a virus into ferrets or so-called humanized mice. These mice have been genetically manipulated to have human lung receptors. The virus undergoes slight mutations as it passes through several generations of mice. The scientists select the strongest mutations until the virus eventually becomes transmissible to humans. The scientific technology today is so good that you can make a whole genome of a virus with no scars, no, no seams or anything. It looks perfectly natural. In 2011, an extreme gain-of-function experiment rocked the science world. Scientists used the serial passaging method to make the H5N1 avian flu virus more transmissible to humans. The lead scientist, Ron Fouchier, claimed he created one of the most dangerous viruses you can make. They had taken a virus that was deadly, but, but not good at infecting humans, and made it also very infectious. So that kind of research, I think, is the risks are immensely high. If it broke out, it, there would be just widespread death. Uh, but the benefits, what are they? <laughs> Many scientists look at this experiment and they think, why? Why did you do this? The thing with the avian flu is that it is extremely deadly, with an infection fatality rate of approximately 60%. Compare that to a rate of under 1% for COVID-19. Luckily, this virus hasn't leaked from a lab so far. But another worry is that a man-made virus like this one could end up in the wrong hands. The main concern was the publication of the research, because once you publish it, then nefarious actors can also have access. It's like if you publish a method on the internet on how to hack a bank account, do you think someone's going to use it? Of course they're going to use it, right? And several you know, terrorist groups have made their intention to use biological warfare known. 
High security BSL-4 labs built for research on highly infectious pathogens are booming around the world and three quarters of them are located in densely populated urban areas. Gain of function research is being conducted in some of these labs in the US, China, Europe and other countries. Although nobody knows for sure in how many of them. But surprisingly, gain-of-function experiments are not done exclusively in highest security BSL-4 labs. Some are done in level 2 and 3 labs. We recently found out that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was doing a lot of this SARS-like uh, virus research at a very low biosafety level. So at a level that you would feel unsafe working with airborne viruses. At BSL-2, you, you may or may not be wearing a lab coat. Uh, you definitely should be wearing gloves. But normally you don't wear a mask at BSL2. So if you're working with airborne viruses, live viruses at BSL2, viruses that can spread through the air, like SARS-CoV-2, then you are completely exposed. It, it was not a, an appropriate biosafety level for working with these SARS-like viruses. Researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology were collecting and researching bad coronaviruses and using humanized mice prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. But the top researcher, Dr. Shi Zhengli, denies she was conducting gain-of-function research. We know uh, from all of the records, from the NIH grant applications, from papers published by the Wuhan Institute of Virology experts, that they were engaged in aggressive research and aggressive work that was making scary pathogenic viruses scarier, better able to infect human cells. Dr. Shi, she says, we did not do gain-of-function research to increase infectivity, right? She picked out just the one. No, she didn't do to increase infectivity. She did to change the host range to make it infectious to us. Making the disease the virus triggers more deadly is one possible aim of gain-of-function research. Another is to make a virus that would normally only attack animals better able to infect a different type of host, humans. What is making things murky is that different definitions of gain-of-function are circulating simultaneously. The reason why it's so confusing and so complicated is because scientists do not know where to draw the line between regular experiments and gain-of-function experiments that are very concerning. So it's only when there is a potential to cause harm to humans that it becomes gain-of-function research of concern. But the question into the origins of the pandemic were stifled in early 2020 when an open letter was published in the medical journal The Lancet. That effectively snuffed out all the debate. They were very well intentioned, but even in the name of those good intentions, engaged in what I call scientific propaganda and thuggery uh, designed to drive uh, consensus when the evidence didn't support that consensus. It was basically trying to shut any scientific debate, and it was quite obvious because there is no way you can reach these conclusions when you don't have data. People said that's a conspiracy theory. That's That's no conspiracy theory. That's an honest scientific possibility. You'll probably note that most people who've been um, shouting down the possibility of a lab leak are virologists. Um, and, you know... <laughs> I'm not, not casting aspersions here, you know, there's many eminent virologists and we need them and their work is vitally important, in, in, um, especially in pandemics, but um, you've got to think about vested interests. If this came from a lab, that means that science has led to millions of people dying by accident. So it's a very uncomfortable thing to think about. They're very... very unpleasant idea for scientists. It wasn't until a group of citizen journalists began to investigate and analyze online databases that the lab leak theory re-emerged. The group, calling themselves Drastic, revealed that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was actively working with SARS-CoV-2 viruses over many years, including the closest known relative to the pandemic virus, 
using inadequate safety protocols. They also discovered that the lab and Chinese authorities have methodically attempted to conceal these activities. I start to get suspicious and start to investigate. You have to play games to try to, you know, get the data. And China is very good at removing things, but if you get there on time, you can get an awful lot. There's been a lot of important information that's come out as a result of what they're calling internet sleuths. But it's really, it's people who are just recognizing that our world is at risk and our governments and the UN system weren't doing uh, what needed to be done. When the WHO looked into the question in early 2021, it concluded that a lab leak was extremely unlikely. But the report was criticized due to the team's lack of access to key data. President Biden has since asked U.S. intelligence agencies to look into the matter, but so far there has been no thorough international investigation. Up to now, we have not had an investigation of the origins of COVID-19. The China WHO uh, joint study uh, has been widely described as an investigation by a lot of media, but they admit that they never had the mandate and they never had the powers or influence to be able to go in there and investigate. So all the evidence right now is circumstantial. Uh, we need to have a credible investigation. If it does turn out that this pandemic was caused by a lab leak, it's going to change the practice of virology forever, everywhere. Although the lab leak theory has recently gained traction, there is still no definitive proof of either a market origin or a lab leak, and both theories remain plausible. But the whole controversy around the origin of the coronavirus has deflected from the larger and arguably more important question whether high-risk research with deadly pathogens should be pursued at all. The reason being that accidents happen, and they happen a lot, even from the highest security labs. And it happens all over the world, internationally, not any one particular country. As a result of a slew of accidents in U.S. labs involving bird flu, Ebola, and anthrax, in 2014, the Obama administration put a moratorium on gain-of-function research. But the ban was full of loopholes. First of all, it was a funding moratorium. You could go on working. If you had money from someplace else, from some other government, or out of your own university, you could go and do what you want. And of course, people went all, all over the world and, and continued to do it. The U.S. moratorium, however limited, was lifted in 2017. But even if there are demonstrable and important scientific gains resulting from this type of research, the question remains, are the risks worth it? Such work can be important because you can argue that by such studies, we will understand better what it takes to block it if an epidemic appears. But at the same time, you're gonna ask as an interested, intelligent, person, not a virologist, you can say, yeah, but by doing so, aren't you creating something that will be more infectious for humans? The answer is yes, but we're learning. And you could say, yes, you're learning, but are you weighing the scale between risk and benefit? Is the gain, which you're not even sure of, this much? But the risk is this much. Isn't that really plausible here? And if so, should we be doing those experiments? I think that's a legitimate discussion. What's happened in biology is very analogous to cybersecurity, where the technology has just leapt ahead way beyond the governance. The governance, our governance of these things is sitting in the last century, right? But the technology has just steamed ahead. It cannot be that individual scientists are making species-wide decisions. That doesn't mean there's not a very important role for scientists but we need to have broader, more inclusive, more democratic frameworks for figuring out the best ways forward. I would not ban it, but I would ask it to be reviewed with international standards. And I would have on committees people beyond expert virologists. I think the public needs to be involved. So definitely this problem should not be regulated by scientists and then performed by scientists ourselves. So because the outcomes of a pandemic, it's not just that only scientists get sick, everybody gets sick. So it affects the whole globe. Uh, that's why this sort of research where the risks are extremely high, 
uh, they need to be discussed with non-scientists as well. I think we need community consultation. We need the community engaged and knowledgeable. We actually did some research to find out how much do people in the general community know about this stuff, and it's very little. And when you give them the information, sort of factual information, they don't find it acceptable. You know, if they, they don't find it acceptable to begin with, but the more information you give, you give people, the less acceptable it becomes for them. So I think, you know, we need to involve the community because the community is the most important stakeholder for which all the benefits and the harms um, apply. There should be transparency. It is not normal that the public didn't know before what was gain of function. The, the society has the right to know what, what is being done. The worst case scenario is we have another pandemic that's much worse than this one. And we're entering the age of synthetic biology where it's easy to imagine a much more dangerous pathogen than the one we are facing now. This could be a life or death moment for our species. And we have this opportunity uh, of this pandemic, as terrible as it's been, to learn the lessons. And to learn those lessons, we need to do a fearless examination of what went wrong. With the growing number of labs in the world now, working with these dangerous pathogens, collecting them, uh, studying them, maybe doing a bit of gain of functional research with them, we, we are entering an era where it's quite likely that there will be a lab-based pandemic. And if we don't deal with that, we're just, just flying blind. Regardless of the true origins of the COVID-19 virus, which we may never know for sure, society still needs to grapple with where to draw the line for research that's done with good intentions and in good faith, but that could put all of humanity at risk if anything goes wrong.